It was that silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth. When the heavens gathered breathless round a lowly stable. When a young mother wept tears of worship, falling on the baby in her arms. And the song of the earth arose in Bethlehem, soft as the tender beating of his heart. And all was calm, all was bright. Yet could this be the same God of Abraham, the conqueror of Israel, this baby? This fragile life. Is this child the one who burned his name in rapture across the gasping skies? Whose voice spoke the oceans into crashing rhythms? Who crafted the mountains into guardians of the firmament? Whose hand ignited the thirst of the deserts and the warring surge of the elemental hosts? Who breathed life from dust? Broke the oppressor's rule? scattered the chains of his people like sand and led them through the wilderness with the pillar of flame. Is this child the one whose presence billowed thunderous on Sinai's peak? Who surrounded Job with the roaring wind, stood defiant in the raging furnace, wrote judgment against tyrants and blazed on the lips of the prophets, scorching history's pages with the fury of his might? Could this be the same God who chose to come as the vulnerable king, setting his throne on straw and manger, drawing forth the tears of shepherds, receiving the gifts of wandering travelers, his fame unknown in this world? He is Jesus, the one who thunders through the heavens, yet whispers to our hearts, who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He is God in the fury, God in the silence. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands, holds our questions till they lose their need, until all we see is him. Good morning, One Hope. Good morning to anyone new that might be joining us this morning. My name is Devante. What a privilege we have to worship our Lord and Savior concluding this year of 2020. So I ask that as we worship him, however you may feel comfortable, that we may rejoice in the joy of the Lord, that he is our strength. Why didn't you pray with me this morning? Jesus, you are the one that empowers us. You're the one that gives us strength. You're the one that gives us life. You're the author and finisher of our faith. So Lord, we put our trust in you this morning. We lay everything at your feet, Jesus, knowing that you're the one that works in us to, for us to persevere. So Jesus, have your way in our worship time. Have your way in our worship service. Lord, have your way in our lives. In your name I pray, amen and amen. Worship the Lord with me. Your life 
through our simple words and deeds, let love be multiplied. Multiply your love through me to someone in need. Help me, Lord, to freely give this grace that I've received. Let my single purpose be imitate your life do my simple words and deeds let love be multiplied let us see your kingdom come through the poor and broken ones let us see a mighty flood of justice and mercy let love be multiplied Multiply your church through us To the ends of the earth Where there's only barrenness Let us see new birth Use us as your laborers Working side by side let your, your harvest come, let love be multiplied. Let us see your kingdom come through the poor and broken ones. Let us see your mighty flood of justice and mercy, oh Jesus. Let love be multiplied. The poor and broken ones. Let us see your mighty flood of justice and mercy. Oh Jesus, let love be multiplied. 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 Let love be Oh, 
Well, it's been a year uh, like, uh, like no other. We've had a plague, uh, we've had lockdowns, we've had social unrest, uh, and if all that was not enough, it's, been, uh, it's all happened during a contentious election year. I think we're all ready to say goodbye to the year 2020. Uh, it's been a year of many trials, um, but even as I say that, I'm reminded of what James says in James chapter 1. He says, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And Paul in 1 Thessalonians says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So, I guess that means we must thank God for this last year, 2020, that we're to consider it pure joy. And we, we do so, actually, because we trust in a good God who uses all circumstances, uh, even the difficult ones, especially the hard seasons of life, to shape us for glory, to, to finish in us what He began, to, to bring us to full maturity. And, and so trusting that, that this is true, for this final message of the year, I thought I would just share uh, some of the lessons um, that I think um, we've needed to, to learn this last year. And, and really, you know, there's so many lessons, too many lessons for, for one message. But I, I landed on seven lessons, because seven is a spiritual number, uh, that I thought I would just kind of throw out there for us to ponder as we close out the year. And, and I try to give some variety here. And so these seven lessons I'll share fall really into seven different categories or, or topics. And the seven categories are these. Lessons about politics, lessons about unity, about government, community, evangelism, finances, and eternity. And uh, some of these, as you can imagine, may fall into the controversial category. Uh, but I see no way to avoid that because it's been a controversial year. Uh, but here's, here's my model I'll try to follow as I, as I go through this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul gives some instructions about marriage, I think it is, doesn't really matter. Point is that in one verse, he says something kind of with apostolic authority, and then a couple of verses later, he gives his opinion about something, and he makes it clear, this is just my opinion, not an actual command from the Lord. Now, I can't quite do that with the same level of authority or clarity as Paul, but I'll try to distinguish as best I can between clear biblical principles that we all, I think, must embrace, and what may just be my own uh, personal opinion or reflection on some of these topics. All right, so here we go. Seven lessons from the year 2020, and we'll, we'll start with the controversial ones and get kind of get those uh, out of the way first. 
Uh, first lesson is in the area of politics, and the first lesson is this. Lesson number one, the kingdom of God is not Republican or Democrat. Now, I don't know anyone at One Hope Church uh, who would disagree with that statement. And I suspect that there are very few Christians, period, who would disagree with that statement. But though we all hopefully agree with that statement in our minds, at a heart level, uh, at that level where we maybe have emotionally invested in a position or positions that we believe are, are righteous positions and and that we also see line up with our own particular political party, it, it's very easy to mistake or confuse allegiance to the kingdom of God with allegiance to a political party or platform. And, and we may not do it consciously. In fact, I don't think we ever would, but it may, it, but at a subconscious level, it's easy to kind of fall into that trap. And here's how you can see if you've fallen into that trap. Uh, if you ever vote uh, in an election in which you feel great about your vote, unconflicted, then you may be mistaking your political party for the kingdom of God. Or if your candidate loses and you are overly devastated, then you may be mistaking your party for the kingdom. Or if your candidate wins and you are overjoyed, then you may be mistaking your party for the kingdom. Because here's the deal. No political party's platform completely lines up with the kingdom, with kingdom values, principles, and goals. Uh, for example, in my opinion, uh, there are some things in the Republican platform that lines up with the kingdom, and there are some things which do not. And there are some things in the Democratic platform that lines up with the kingdom, and there are some things that do not. For the Christian, I think, Every election, you should feel at least some inner conflict because, because you're a member of the kingdom of God first and a political party second, uh, if you are a member of a political party. Uh, and I do think, and again, sharing my opinion here, that it's okay as a Christian to be active in a political party, but you should do so as a secret agent, working on behalf of a higher authority, Authority to influence your party with regard to kingdom values, knowing that as a Christian, you will, you will be at odds with some aspects of your party's platform because, again, neither political party or any political party completely lines up with the biblical principles of the kingdom of God, that Jesus came to spread throughout the earth like leaven working its way through the dough. As Christians, we are ultimately part of a subversive movement. We are working within the system, have infiltrated both parties to bring an end to the world as we know it. For Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. John 18, verse 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Right, let me put it another way. There are certain kingdom principles that as Christians, I think we all must embrace. Uh, and we should all want our society uh, to grow and mature and em embrace those kingdom values. But how we achieve that as a society falls into the arena of politics, which is a means to an end. And those means are debatable. We should all want the same thing. How we get there is going to differ based on your own political philosophy. Now, I know that as Christians who differ in our political philosophies, and, and some of us passionately so, this can feel hard. But we have to see that though we may differ with regard to the, the means, as Christians, we are on the same team with our ultimate allegiance to King Jesus. We all want the same thing, even if we have differences, perhaps passionate differences politically about how to get there. Which leads to our next category, unity. The next lesson is this. Lesson number two, true unity is hard work. You know, I think um, up to this point as a church, um, we may have taken our unity as a church as kind of a given. 
You know, I often boast to my pastor friends that our church is so politically diverse, and yet we have maintained great unity through the years. We really do love each other, even if we disagree on politics. And, and I still believe that that is true about us. But I think, I think we're being tested these days in this area, particularly with this last year being so politically charged, uh, even maybe more so than perhaps in past election cycles. Um, this last year, I've just been kind of sensing an increased political tension within our church family. Uh, some of it uh, coming from those of us on the right and some of it coming from those of us on the left. And it's, it's kind of just made me ask the question, are we really as unified as I think we are? Uh, is it true unity that we have or could it be that some of our unity is surface level? And I, and I ask the question because I think we all agree that Perhaps one way that we maintain unity as a church, one hope, is, is we just simply don't talk politics. And, uh, or, we, or we don't talk politics unless we're hanging out with one hope members who share your own political perspective. Uh, and it's true. I know that for a number of our small groups, um, great, have great community and unity and love in a number of our small groups uh, that also have members of different political views. And as I've kind of heard from uh, a number of you actually recently talk about that unity, a number of you have shared uh, that, yeah, we just, we just don't talk politics. And, and I have that policy myself. I mean, I just, I just don't talk politics. If I think there might be a clash of views, I, I don't like conflict. Um, and, and I think there's a place for that kind of kind of unspoken agreement to just not talk politics, but there is a downside to it too, particularly in this political climate where to get your message across, and, and here I'm referring to the kind of larger society now, there is just this, this ungracious demonization of the other side, whichever side you're on. Uh, there's kind of a sweeping of each other with broad strokes and and I, and I think um, how that would negatively kind of filter down to us uh, as a politically diverse church family is, is if we don't ever talk about our political views, we may be at some level, even if it's perhaps kind of subconsciously, be making internal judgments about each other based on what we perceive is the views of the other person that we're pretty sure differs from our own. And we may end up kind of brushing each other with the same broad strokes that the world uses at some subconscious level. And the result is, is an uneasy tension at times and, and even perhaps mistrust because you're, you're, you've shut down communication on certain topics. Now, I, I don't know um, what the solution is, but maybe our reluctance to talk politics reveals a lack of willingness to do the hard work of Christian unity, which involves talking through our differences and seeking to understand each other's perspectives, even, even if it leaves us in disagreement over issues. It takes energy to do the hard work of relationship building and, and of seeing, trying to see issues from, from another side and of, and of doing so with love and respect and integrity and learning how to express your own views without anger and prejudgment. And, and so maybe, maybe we should talk politics a bit more as a church, um, not from the pulpit. And in fact, I'll just reiterate what is, I think, an unspoken rule uh, of ours. Um, and one I think that we should still have, but I'll just I'll speak it out loud, and that we should not talk politics from the pulpit, so to speak. Uh, for example, no side political comment when you're giving an announcement or reading scripture, no po politics in our sermons. Um, and we haven't done that, I don't think, but I just want to make sure everyone hears me actually say it out loud. Uh, let's not do that. But at a relational level, maybe we should. Do the hard work of communicating through differences at times at least. At least. Um, found it intriguing that um, someone recently uh, told me of a church in Michigan like ours that is politically divided. And, and there was that unspoken tension, no one really kind of knowing what each other is really thinking politically. And, and a mistrust kind of uh, was building. And so at an elder meeting, uh, the pastor had them just go around in the circle and just share uh, who you voted for and why. Just get it out there on the table. And, and in that instant, it really helped clear the air and helped in understanding different perspectives and creating a more healthy leadership team. Now, 
Don't worry, One Hope Church elders, I'm actually not that brave. Uh, and, and have no fear, One Hope congregation, I'm not going to share any sermon who I voted for and why. But any of you, if you want to know, ask me sometime over a cup of coffee. And I'll tell you who I voted for and why. And then, then you tell me who you voted for and why. And, and we may need to di- agree to disagree on some things, perhaps. But then, having done that, let's set it all aside and keep following Jesus together. Now, that actually may not sound very appealing to have those conversations. It may sound very uncomfortable. But that's the point. True Christian unity is hard work. The text for this one is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. That's active, not passive. We've been maintaining unity through this passive thing. Just don't talk about the differences. True unity involves effort, communication, working to understand each other, having enough respect for one another that that we're willing to hear a perspective that doesn't line up with our politics. Doesn't mean we have to agree. Doesn't mean you have to be less passionate about your own views, but do the hard work of understanding each other, uh, where where each other we're really coming from. And then, and then let's keep following Jesus together. Okay. Almost through the controversial lessons. One more lesson that might be a little controversial. Speaking of issues around which good Christians can disagree, lesson number three comes in the category of government. And in particular, the question of are we to obey the government or not? Uh, It's been an interesting uh, year with regard to all the government mandates this year. Um, This has, of course, been a point of contention. Um, And speaking as one who has generally been supportive, I am generally supportive, uh, not completely uncritical of every rule and and guideline, but generally I'm supportive of of the government's guidelines, including those for churches, uh, for church gatherings. I think our elected officials in general, are are, they mean well, they're they're doing the best that they can. That said, let's face it and be honest, I mean, there has been this year quote-unquote, intrusion into our lives, including our church life and worshiping practices uh, by the government to a degree not experienced before in, in any of our, our lifetimes. And, and, and depending on where you land on, on the mandates and the guidelines or whatever the issues might be, um, determines which Bible verses you choose to quote to get your point across. For example, some of you might quote Peter who says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him, to punish those who do wrong and to command those who do right. But then others of you might quote the very same Peter in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter said, Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. But then some of you might quote Paul saying in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which is which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. But then others of you will point out the example of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. I mean, why did Daniel break the law and still pray publicly three times a day? He couldn't, couldn't he have just kind of done it secretly? So, which is it? Do you obey or not obey? The answer is lesson number three. Lesson number three is this. There's a time to obey, and there's a time to disobey. Where where government tells you to do something that God has told us not to do, or to embrace something that God has told us not is not right, or to to not do something uh, that God has told you to do, those are issues where we are to disobey as Christians. And sometimes it's really easy to determine which is which, Uh, when to obey and when to not obey, but sometimes it gets fuzzy and takes discernment from the Spirit. 
But when it is fuzzy, uh, I think Jesus gives us a really good example of how you can obey without, without being a sheep or a lemming, how you can obey the government while disagreeing with the government. Uh, in Matthew 17, verse 24 to 27, Jesus essentially disagrees with the government, but advocates obedience anyway. In other words, he, he hints at the need for eventual reform without advocating revolt or disobedience in the moment. Listen to this, verse 24. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, uh, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? he asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect the duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Hmm. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the fit first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for your tax, uh, for my tax and yours. Isn't that fascinating? Jesus, he advocates paying taxes, even though he knows the corruption that exists, the unfairness that exists. He acknowledges that, but, but then says, let's not cause offense. No need to die on that hill. He had another hill that he was planning to die on. Jesus saw the big picture. He was playing the long game. Lots more. I could and should say on this topic, but may be best to save that for a whole other sermon sometime called When to Obey and When to Not Obey the Government. Lots more principles we could go over on this one. For now, though, just know uh, that there is a time and a place for both. All right, moving on. With this next one, I think we're finally leaving the controversial topics, I think. Um, so you can relax now for the rest of the message here. Fourth lesson is in the category of community. Uh, of relationships. And, and it's this, lesson number four, we need each other. Now, extroverts, you already knew that, but we introverts, we had to learn that lesson the hard way this year, and it's actually taken a while for us to get there, uh, but, but we've, we've finally gotten there. And because, I mean, at first, remember early on the lockdowns when everything was totally locked down and uh, everything was shut down? We introverts were in heaven, and you extroverts, we're not in heaven. And I remember uh, recently this uh, a post from a, a fellow introvert of mine from Minnesota. Uh, she posted that, uh, I think it was about the time that the lockdowns were going to approaching an end. We're going to be actually be able to go outside again soon. It was just something to the effect of, uh, please, governor, uh, let the extroverts out first uh, for a couple weeks. And then after they've had a couple weeks to kind of jump around on each other, then then let us introverts out, kind of slip into the crowd, you know, quietly or something to that effect. And though I, I identify with that perspective as an introvert, the reality is um, that not staying connected has taken its toll on all of us. Uh, it's become clear we really do need each other. Uh, as a church, we've suffered. And, and so the lesson is that uh, if, if for whatever reason, now or in the future, we can't meet in person. We have to stay connected in other ways for our spiritual health. And the scripture text for this one is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. says this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, uh, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And that, of course, is, is not referring to those not gathering because of a plague, but I, I think it just those who have kind of fallen out of the habit for whatever reason. But the key phrase there for us, I think, is this, let us consider how to stir up one another. Uh, if we can't meet in person, let us consider how to stir up one another. And so, yeah, no one likes Zoom, but use it if there is no other way. Uh, and no one likes gathering while wearing masks, but if there's no other way to meet, then sacrifice your likes, put up with some discomfort for the sake of your brother or sister, because 
we need each other. The Christian life is, is not designed to be lived on our own. It needs community to work. We're like burning coals in a fire pit. Take one of those coals out of the fire and set it aside and it's eventually going to cool off. But put it back with the other heated coals and it quickly regains its warmth. Same is true for us as Christians. And so consider how to stir one another to stoke the flame. And then lesson number five uh, has to do with the category of evangelism. Uh, our mission as the church is to seek and save the lost. That mission doesn't get put on hold because of COVID or any other obstacle that may come in our way. And so while we want to abide by state guidelines that are put in place to protect our health, and we do, we must get creative and still be about the mission to tell the good news about the Jesus vaccine to everyone who will listen. And we, we do that intelligently, respectfully, and with sensitivity to both the spirit and to people, but we do it using any means necessary. That's the lesson number five. Lesson number five, use any means necessary. And the scripture for this one that came to my mind was Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, very different circumstances, but Paul expresses how he will let go of his own rights and do it, what he needs to do to focus on the greater mission of evangelism. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. I love that phrase, that by all means I might save some. All means necessary. And I, I do just love how the church has been kind of adapting, doing that, has getting been getting creative. Everyone is making videos now and Church websites look way better than they ever have, have been finally kind of getting the online community presence thing figured out using technology for the kingdom. And Paul, he, he led the way on that. Uh, when he was put in prison and he, and he couldn't preach in the marketplaces anymore and he couldn't visit house churches that he had started, what did he do? Did he retire? Did he give up? No. Uh, he harnessed the new technology of letter writing, and from his prison, through those letters, he moved the world. The Holy Spirit is a creative spirit, and he is in you, and he is in me. Uh, let him guide you to get creative in spreading the good news about the Jesus vaccine. And then, lesson number six has to do with money. And the lesson is this, lesson number six, don't build your house on the sand. Building your life uh, with money and riches as your foundation puts you on very shaky ground. It's like building your house on the sand. Proverbs 11, 28, whoever trusts in his riches will fall. In 1 Timothy 6, 17, as for the rich in this present age, and, and that's all of us, you know, globally, historically, if you live in the 21st century in America, you are rich. Uh, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And if this year has taught us anything, it's taught us about the uncertainty of riches. Uh, but we may have forgotten that lesson, so I step back with me just for a moment. Do you remember what March felt like when the whole world uh, was coming to an end. The, we all, the whole world went into a lockdown and the stock market plummeted by nearly half its value. We had no idea it would come back. Um, it felt like the end of the world. Do you remember that? Um, and though now th things have changed since March and, and we have largely rebounded from that critical place, even if some are still struggling, my challenge to us is let's not forget that lesson we learned, that feeling we had back then uh, when everything that we thought was secure suddenly was, was obvious, was being shaken, was not secure. Let's, let's not forget that lesson or God might have to shake us up again. And then finally, the last lesson uh, comes from something actually that happened this year pre-COVID. Uh, did you remember that actually there were some things that happened pre-COVID this year? January 26th was one of them. Uh, we had uh, one of our first tragedies of the year 2020, Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna. 
and seven others died in a tragic helicopter accident. Lesson number seven is this. We don't know the day or the hour, so be ready. And the scripture text for this one is Matthew 24, verse 44. Uh, Jesus, he gives this analogy. Uh, if you knew at what time of the night a, a thief was going to come and break into your house, you'd be ready for him at that hour. But if you don't know what time he's going to break into the house, you're going you're, you're to be ready all night. And so Jesus then concludes, therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And, and that can apply to the fact that we don't know um, uh, when Jesus is going to return, but even if his return is yet hundreds or even thousands of years in the future, for you, it's only a matter of decades at most. Uh, for some of us, it may be a matter of years. Uh, for when we breathe our last, our next conscious moment will be in his presence, at his co coming, you could say. Are you ready? You don't know what that day uh, will, will be, when it will happen. And, and for many of us, uh, we'll have some warning. Uh, there'll be a sickness or a period of failing health, perhaps years or months of convalescence to prepare yourself. But for others of us, it will happen suddenly, tragically. You don't know what day or hour it will be. So be ready all the time. Start every day like it's your last. Now, I don't know what was in the heart and mind of, of Kobe Bryant on that last day for him. I mean, it's been widely publicized that he went to early mass with his daughter that very morning. Uh, he and Guyana were abiding in Jesus in that last morning, uh, not knowing that they would be seeing him face to face in just a matter of minutes, uh, which is pretty, good, pretty cool planning, a great way to go, you could almost say. But this is really actually more about being ready in your heart level. I mean, it's, it's okay if your last thought before you die is not super spiritual or, or, or you're not doing something churchy uh, in those last moments. Rather, this just gets to the heart level. Are you at some level all the time longing for that day, longing to be with Him, having your hopes set on Him alone, your treasure in heaven, not on earth? Paul. Paul's last words in, in 2 Timothy verse four to, uh, chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, is, he says this, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Are you longing for his appearing all the time? Uh, whether that appearing is at, at his return or at the moment of your own departure, have it in your heart to finish strong. Eyes on the prize, Jesus is the prize. So we close here. Uh, just consider where your hope is placed as we move into the year 2021. Not sure what direction Devante will take uh, in, in the message for next week, but I'll just leave you with that thought as kind of a segue into next week's sermon on hope for 2021. For now, though, let's, let's close out this year with thankfulness for the year 2020. Paul says, be thankful in all things. And let's consider all the trials that we've had, as James says, as pure joy knowing that God's going to use all these circumstances, is using all these circumstances to finish what he started, to prepare us for eternity. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this difficult year that you have used to, to shake us up and to, to teach us how, to, how to, to, to grow us. So, Father, do whatever you need to do to finish what you started in us, and, and may it all be for the glory of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the main character in the drama, the actor on center stage. We are the sporting cast. All glory to Jesus. Amen.